We are on a new, not a new series, but in the middle of a series called Empowered. Given the power to do something. Empowered. Given the power to do something. And we just take a moment to kind of connect the dots here. Remember how uh, we celebrated Easter and uh, the resurrection of Christ. And for a lot of people, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, almost feels like the end of the story. You know, it's kind of like you got his birth, and then you have his ministry, and then we celebrate a Good Friday and Easter Sunday, and it feels like that's kind of the end of the story. He's risen, yay, we close the book. But it's not the end of the story. Right. Go ahead and say amen, engage. Amen. The end of the story is not Resurrection Sunday. That's kind of the middle of the story. Because the story continues now. You are part of the story right now. The story doesn't end when Jesus ascends to heaven. It, that's actually the middle of the story. Because guess what? Here you are now. And one of these days, Christ is coming back. Amen. Amen. And so uh, we're talking about then going up to Pentecost Sunday, which is May 20th by the way, and that's kind of considered to be the birthday of the church, when the church uh, received the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And so we're kind of teaching up, working our way up to that, where the, uh, the Holy Spirit empowers the church. And there were three kind of key verses, we'll move quickly here, but let's be sure we're on these, that fill this. First was Luke 24, uh, starting verse 44, and it reads, Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And this is Jesus' words to his disciples after his resurrection, but before his ascension into heaven. And a couple of the key concepts here. We talk about being empowered. First of all, he says he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Comprehend the scriptures. They might say, what, were they stupid? What was the deal? No, what happened was they had been raised all their life to think of the Messiah in a certain way. To think of his coming in a certain context. And we talked about this at Easter, how they were expecting a military Messiah to come and take over the government and throw out the Romans. And they had this whole King David thing in their head. And he had to open their minds so they could see this thing from a whole different perspective. And not just that, but he goes on to talk about how they're going to take uh, and preach repentance and remission to all nations. Now before you miss that, get this. They hadn't often thought that their Jewish faith was for anybody but a Jew. Whoa, see that'll change your brain a little, right? Remember, they had been raised, the Jews were God's chosen people, the Messiah was for the Jews, and all of a sudden, he said, you're going to take this not just to the Jews, but to the world. Talk about a brain expansion, right? That's what he was doing for them, right there. Verse 48, the next thing. He says, you are witnesses of these things. Now, don't get caught up in thinking, it's like they're going to talk about things in the past. You are a witness of this thing. It says, you have a mission to go forward and tell about what you see. It was a call to a mission to go out there and tell people what you've seen, what you've experienced. You are a witness of these things. And then finally, he says, the third thing, the promise of the Father was to come upon them. This empowering, you are endued with power from the high. You are empowered. So you see this idea of being empowered, this whole sermon series here, is talking about this very thing. You know, you are given power to do something with it. Say amen. amen. All right. Then, after we looked at that verse, we looked at Acts chapter 1, 4 through 8. Acts chapter 1, 
4 through 8. This happens, you know, historically after what we just read. It says, being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. See, that's just what he had talked about before, which he said, you've heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but, but, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So he meets with them, and he talks about this power, the promise of the Father, right? But now he gives it a name. The name. It's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He says, stay in Jerusalem. He says, I know you're excited. You want to get out there. I get it. But stay here until this promise of the Father. You receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So they stay there until that has happened. And then Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and on one, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterances. So that is the promise of the Father Jesus told them to wait for on the day of Pentecost. Now, we think of Pentecost in this light, but in their view, that would have been one of the Jewish feasts. And it followed after uh, the whole Easter thing, you know, the whole Passover. Pentecost, five weeks later, you had, it was the first harvest, the celebration of the first harvest. And so that's what they were in Jerusalem for, this day of Pentecost. And then it became something much, much more, right? Because this flowing of the Holy Spirit upon the church, the birthday of the church, came upon them. So, let's talk about today, at for today. I want to make a statement and have you track with me. This is what I've written. The mission of God empowers us to accomplish, what the mission of God empowers us to accomplish will require personal growth, change, and faith, often in unexpected ways and circumstances. Growth, change, and faith. Growth, faith, and change. I'm going to get you to interact with me. Repeat after me. Growth. Good. And say change. Change. Let's do that one again. Change. Change. How many here hate change? Come on. I'm one of those guys. I'm not a big change guy. But I recognize, you know, it's part of the picture here. So we have growth, we've got change, and faith. Say faith. 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 Okay. So, this mission of God that he's calling these apostles to, that he's called us to now, all these generations later, is about growth and change and faith. Now, let's look at each of those, and then we'll, we'll bring it home. First, what about growth? Personal growth. This empowering. You know, God doesn't want us to stay the same. He calls us to grow, to expand ourselves. Think about these apostles. When they started out, most of them were fishermen. A few were tax collectors. And these folks were not what you'd call world-changing leaders. Can you get what I'm saying? These were salt-of-the-earth people. They weren't folks that had, you know, political aspirations. They weren't folks who were looking forward to one day, you know, running a big movement. They were family men who were, who were, you know, doing their thing. And along comes Jesus and he says, well, that may be what you were, but I've got growth for you. You're going to change the world. Can you imagine some fisherman sitting in his boat thinking, me change the world? Right. You know, but that's what he was calling them to. Personal growth. Way beyond what they could imagine. The empowering for that. Second, change. Boy, there was a lot of change that had to happen for these disciples. You just stop and think about it. They had to change their friends. They had to change their habits. Had to change their jobs. Some of them had to change where they lived. Many of them had to change their whole outlook on life. 
I mean, they've been raised to think of things in a certain light. Here comes Jesus, and he smashes the whole thing. And all of a sudden, they are people being asked to change the whole paradigm for how they're living and what they're living for. Change. And then faith. Can you imagine? Just imagine yourself. Because, you know, we're not a whole lot different than those fishermen. Imagine if God said to you, I want you to preach the gospel to the entire world. You're going to take the gospel and change the world. You're probably just like me. You go, right, me? Yeah, it's, if, if somebody else needs that job, right? The job was so big, it required so much faith. And God calls us to faith as well. Growth, change, faith. Listen, guys, the Christian life should never be boring. Come on. I mean, if you're bored, you're not getting it. Because growth is never easy. Change is hard. And faith is never boring. So the Christian life, if we're living it the way Jesus calls us to live it, you'll never be bored. There's always something more out there that can be done. Something else to be accomplished. I want to tell you a story this morning out of Scripture of just such an example. And then we're going to use those pieces of papers in a very unique way. So turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 6. i got to move quickly. But I want to tell you a story about a person whose life was changed, who had personal growth, and who had to have faith. All of the empowering of the Holy Spirit in his life. In a way that actually did change the world. So you're in Acts, chapter 6. Starting with verse 5. So the church is born on the day of Pentecost. They're in Jerusalem. And... And uh, the church was formed as Peter preaches and thousands are saved. And now they're trying to get organized. And when you come to chapter 6, verse 5, uh, we can read this together. And it says, The same pleased the multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And I might underline that because we're going to talk a little bit about Stephen. Now we're talking about the first deacons or leaders of the church here. Because they realized really quickly that the 12 apostles... You know, weren't called to be organizers and administrators and all this kind of thing. And they had to have some deacons. So it says they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. And there arose from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrian, and those from Sicily and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist his wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. So the story begins with Stephen, the first deacon. It says he's a mighty man of faith and power. He's praying. Great things are happening. The church is growing. You know, even priests, Jewish priests are getting saved. And this, this whole thing is starting to travel and get to be a big deal. And they can't argue Stephen in the ground. He's just too smart. He's, got, he's full of the Holy Spirit. And so they bring false charges against him. And they bring him up on charges that he spoke against Moses in the temple. That they can accuse him of blasphemy. Is what they're, what they're trying to do here. Now, if you want to look at chapter 7, verse 55. What happens, of course, is they stir up the crowd. Uh, and they find him guilty. And they take him outside, and they're going to stone him. See, in those days, if you didn't follow the, the party line, they had the, the power to kill you. Can you imagine what happened to, to some of us today if we got stoned if we didn't follow the party line? But this was the thing that happened to, to Stephen. They find him unjustly uh, guilty, and they take him out to have him killed. Uh, for being a, a Christian and sharing his faith. Then verse 55, I'm moving quickly here, of chapter 7. And the he here is Stephen, okay? And Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, 
I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they, this is the crowd, cry out with a loud voice. They stop their ears and they run at him with one accord and cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep or he died. That's what that means, he died. So it's a mob scene. And they rush at him and they kill him by throwing stones at him. What a terrible, brutal way to die be pummeled by rocks and stones. And they, they kill him, and as he's dying, he has this vision, and he, he speaks it out. The key here of my story, though, isn't Stephen, it's this young man named Saul. See, God has a way of working things. You don't always know how it's working, but he has a way. Because it says they laid their feet, they laid their uh, coats at the feet of Saul. What in the world, what does that mean? Was he the coat keeper? What's the deal? No, it meant something. It meant that Saul was the one who had brought the charges against him. Saul's the guy who had signed the papers. He's the guy who had been out front on the charges against Stephen. And so when it came time to execute him, to cast the stones and kill Stephen, they laid their coats at Saul's feet as a way of saying, this is your thing. You know, you're the one accountable for this. You're responsible for this, Saul. And Saul was there at that point. And so the story now goes from Stephen to Saul. Look at Acts chapter 8. Follow me now. Acts chapter 8. It says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. And at that time a great persecution arose against the church. It was at Jerusalem. And they were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made a great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Okay, got it, guys? Saul's a bounty hunter. He's going after Christians. He's arresting them, having them thrown in prison. Saul is so zealous for his Jewish faith that he's having innocent people thrown in jail. This is a guy who was zealous for his Judaism and saw the Christians as a threat to his faith. And so, uh, you know, he's a persecutor. This is a dangerous man, a violent man. This is a man that Christians would watch out for and possibly even fear. Everybody tracking with me who this Saul is? This Saul is not the Christian's friend. Dangerous man, a powerful man, violent man. All right? Now, go to chapter 9. Flip over to chapter 9. Starting with verse 1. Watch what happens to Saul. Watch what God can do. 9.1. It says, Then Saul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. And he led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. So Saul is going along the road with his caravan. He's going north to Damascus, where he's going to arrest more Christians, bring them back to Jerusalem where they can be tried. And he's got letters from the priests. He's probably got a caravan of, of uh, temple soldiers and guards. As he goes along, God has his say in the matter. And what it says is God knocked him off the horse, 
blind to them, and speaks to them. What if you caught the uh, irony of that little phrase? He says, who are you, Lord? Can you imagine what it must have gone through in Saul's heart when he hears the words, I am Jesus. The very one he's killing people about. Knocks them off the horse and says, yeah, hey, you're wrong. You're 100% wrong. 180 degrees wrong. I mean, you are wrong, Saul. You got the whole story wrong. The whole thing's wrong. Everything's wrong. Man, you are blind. That's the thing with the blindness. It's like a metaphor as well as a real thing, right? You're blind, Saul. You got a lot of zeal, but you're blind. I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. So they take him to Damascus, and then he's there for three days. Now here's where I like to think maybe you and I come in, this story. Because now the story involves another person, a believer. We're looking at verse 10. Verse 10 of chapter 9. And this is where I like to think you and I might come into the story. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus whose name was Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he's praying. And in vision he's seen a man named Ananias coming in putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. I, I love Ananias. I think he's a lot like us. He has this vision. God tells him what he's supposed to do. He says, go find this Saul of Tarsus and pray for him. But he says, ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> uh, God, uh, we've heard about this guy. And he has permission to arrest us. And Lord, you know, if you can read between the lines, I think he's kind of saying, I'd rather not. Can you pick somebody else? Because this guy's dangerous. And I don't know if I want to do that. And think about what the Lord was asking him to do. He was asking him to go before one of the worst enemies of the church, right? A powerful, violent, angry, as far as he knew, man, who now has been struck blind. So now you got to wonder, is he really mad? If he was mad before, now what's his mood? And you're being asked to go there and lay hands on him and pray for his healing. And you know what I think might have gone through his mind? Uh, what happens if it don't work? <laughs> All right. What if I get there and pray for him and he's still blind? And now he knows who I am. And this could not go well, Lord. Talk about a challenge for Ananias. What a wonderful mission God gives him to go pray for this guy. But holy mackerel, I mean, talk about faith. We don't know anything about Ananias. Did he have a ministry of healing? We don't know. Had he ever prayed for somebody? We don't know. All we know is he was told, go pray for this powerful, angry man and pray for a miracle of healing. Wow. Talk about risk. He's got to be thinking, well, I know about the mission, Lord. But I sure hope your power is with me. Right? Thank you for the mission. But boy, you better come along with me, God. Or, or this is not going to go well. 9.17. We're almost done. 9.17. It's an interesting story. So Ananias obeys. We're so thankful for that. It says he went his way and entered the house. He laid his hands on him and says, Brother Saul... The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came and sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. And when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with those disciples at Damascus and immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues. 
that he is the Son of God. And all who heard it were amazed. Said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem? And he's come here for that purpose? So he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Wow, what a story. This guy who had gone there to arrest and kill Christians is now preaching Jesus. Immediately it says. It says he got up, he was baptized, he's a Christ follower, bang, just like that. How did that happen? Well, God took all of that talent, all of that intelligence, all of that education, all of that power, all that emotion, and in one minute, just bang, he turns it around, and now you got this man of God on fire, changing the world. But you think about it, Saul's conversion didn't just happen like that. It began with Stephen. And then it was, right? Yeah. It began with Stephen. And then it goes, it goes to this road of Damascus with the Lord knocking him off the horse. And then the obedience of Ananias. And you can follow this chain of events that led to this Man, of course, we call the Apostle Paul, right? He wrote most of our New Testament. And you've got to ask yourself, what if? What if Ananias had said, nope, uh-uh, not my thing, you know? What if he hadn't done that? What if Stephen had backed up and said, no, it's okay, I don't, you know? You just got to wonder. And here's the point I want to make today. Who's the Saul in your life? You know? There may be somebody in your life, in your circle of friends, in your family, somebody who is so far from God right now, you know, you're like, he'd never get saved. He could never know Jesus. He's a lost cause. You know, maybe there's somebody you know who mocks Jesus, who makes fun of church, you know, and you just think, this guy could never. Don't you think they said that about Saul? Don't you think they said that about Saul? And here's the thing, it's so interesting to recognize. Your obedience to receiving an empowerment from God, to doing what God calls you to do, your obedience might be part of a whole chain of events that leads to somebody getting saved who changes the world. It might not be you, but it could be somebody you know. You just never know. You know, I've come to understand that the people who mock our faith the most who are the angriest about our faith, the people who just give us the hardest time, a lot of times, they're closer to Christ than you think. Because let me tell you, anybody that puts that much energy into hating this, they're thinking about it. Yeah. Right? I mean, if they're putting that much energy into it, there's something going on inside of there. The ones who are far are the ones who are apathetic and give a rip one way or another. But guys who are really negative, gals who just hate the faith, they're just this far from tipping and becoming like Saul. Jesus said to Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. Right now in your life, there is somebody out there who is kicking against the goats. Now what in the world, what does that mean? A goad was a long stick with a point on the end. And when they were taking uh, herds of sheep or goats, they would take it and they'd poke them and kind of get them, get going, get going, you know, kind of prod them. And what was happening is that Paul was being prodded by the Holy Spirit, even if he hated Christians. He was being prodded by God, something inside, right? And he was pushing back really hard. And the thing is, there's somebody in your life right now that the Holy Spirit is prodding. There's somebody in your life that the Holy Spirit is working on right now. And you may not even know it. You may wonder who that person could be, but they're out there. And you could be like an Ananias in their life. You could be the one, when you listen to the Holy Spirit's gentle voice, that could be a part of a chain of events to bring them to Christ. Church, I think that we lose, we lose faith way too soon with people. And I know this, we are empowered to do something, and that something we're empowered to do, now listen, this is big, The something we're empowered to do involves people. Because Christ died for people. Right? He died for people. And what God is calling us to an empowerment for is to help people 
in our lives. And I'm just wondering, who's that Saul in your life? Do you know who it is? Maybe you know him right away. This person that seems so far from God, not interested, family member, co-worker, could be a child, a grandchild, could be a spouse, somebody who just seems so far from God. But the Holy Spirit is working in them. And you just never know what the Holy Spirit's going to do. The Holy Spirit is a wonderful, wonderful storyteller and makes things happen in ways we never expect. You never know. I bet you Ananias never thought he'd be praying for Saul. And I bet you Saul never thought he'd be laying in the dirt on the road blind. But God has a way of doing things. I want to close with a story I shared about the Continental Theological Seminary. How God does wonderful things and you never know. Your, your part in this chain of events that can bring people to Christ, you just never know. Pastor Dimitrov, I have a picture of him here. Here he is. He's the dean of the seminary there in Belgium. And uh, uh, I want to tell you the story. I may not get every detail right in this. It was a very emotional story. I, I tried to get it all written down correctly. But as I said earlier, he, he is the dean of a theological seminary, the Continental Theological Seminary. It's the only non-state funded seminary in Belgium. Okay, But it's also the largest seminary in Belgium. <laughs> Yeah, even though they don't take any state funds. And they have over 200 students. And one of their, the missions they've been trying to do for decades is to be accredited by the, the state. Now, they're not looking for any money from the state, but they love to have their curriculum accredited by the state. And they've tried this over and over and over again. And to be accredited as a college is a long process. It involves a lot of paperwork. And uh, in Belgium, they have to submit it to the government because the government supervises the church in Belgium, believe it or not, they do. And so they have to submit paperwork to the government to have their seminary accredited. And they tried it on two, two occasions before, and every time they were declined. And the state would say this, basically, Assemblies of God, you're a sect, you're not a religion, we don't recognize you. So they could never get accredited. They would accredit a Lutheran thing, you know, or a Methodist thing, but they wouldn't accredit an Assembly of God thing. And they had almost given up the hope of being an, becoming accredited by the state. And then the uh, pastor tells the story of what, is, what just recently transpired. It's, it's a chain of events that makes my point. So in their seminary it was a young man from Africa. And I can't even begin to pronounce his name, so I'm sorry I won't be able to give it. It's a very uh, African name. And he, poor young man, had come there to study for the Lord, go back to Africa as a missionary. And he had very little money, very little resources there at the seminary. And he would ride the bus to school every morning. And as he would ride the bus, he'd sit there as a long ride. And he would pray in the spirit as he was going to, to school in the morning. He'd just sit there and mind his own business. Just be praying, praying in the Spirit. And one morning, he was praying in the Spirit. Uh, a woman was sitting across from him there. And she uh, taps him on his knee as he's praying. And, it's, and he, he looks at her and, and she says, So, are you a Christian? Now, in Belgium, this is a kind of a rarity. Okay? And he says, Yes, I am a Christian. And she says, Were you praying? And he says, Yes, yes, ma'am, I, I was praying just, just now. And the woman says, well, tell me about yourself, you know, you know, what do you do? And he says, well, I'm a student, I'm here from Africa, and I'm a student at the Continental Theological Seminary. And the woman says to him, I've never heard of a Continental Theological Seminary. And he says, well, you know, it's a, it's a real thing, and uh, we have a couple hundred students, and I'm studying to be a pastor there. And she says, well, I can't believe uh, that I've never heard of that. And uh, I don't even know that's a real thing. And she says, uh, uh, listen, if you ever need anything or whatever, and, here's, here's, and she hands him a business card. It says, give me a call if you ever need anything. We love people from Africa here. And she's very kind. So he takes the card and follows. He sticks it in his pocket of his jacket, right? And uh, they get to their stop, and they go their separate ways. Well, a week goes by, okay? And, and, and nothing's happened. Nothing's transpired. And suddenly, a Pastor Dimitrov is in his office, there's a knock on the door, and it, it's, um, Pastor, I gotta talk to you, I gotta talk to you. And it's this young man. And he comes in to speak to the pastor, he says, Pastor, I don't know what to do with this, but look, and he hands him the card. And this card from this woman, it turns out that this woman was a government official who was head of all secondary education in the nation of Belgium. <laughs> Sitting there. 
And he'd been a week, you know, he just hadn't pulled it out. And he hands it to him and says, what do we do now? So, as the pastor says, well, I told the young man, call her. <laughs> so he calls her. And she says, well, I never knew there was such a seminary. How come you're not part of our, you're not accredited? And, and well, you guys never accredited us. And the woman says, well, I'm head of all secondary education in the nation. I'm going to see to this. Get your paperwork together. So they begin filling out the paperwork. And they're pretty excited. You know, hey, we got a big hitter on our team here, right? So they got the paperwork together. They got it to her. And she took it to, uh, to the uh, parliament to be approved. And they got declined. Parliament voted no. Uh -uh. Again, we would credit them. Well, they were disappointed, but you know, it happened before, right? Well, this woman contacts this young man again. And this time says, hey, listen, I've got a couple tickets to the opera. And I know you don't have a lot of money and you're a student and everything. Would you like these tickets to go to the opera? So, she, you know, the young man takes her up on it, gets the tickets, he goes to the opera. He's sitting there, and his buddy who's going to go with him cancels, so he has to go by himself. He's sitting there with an empty chair next to him. This is a real story. He's sitting there at the opera. He's never seen, you know, an opera. He's just in awe of this thing. Empty chair. The thing is starting to go, and here's this door, and some guy comes running down the aisle. It plops right down next to him and says, I know it's not my seat, but I'm late. Can I just sit here? And the young man says, well, sure, you know, so he, he sits there. And so it comes to the intermission of the opera. And so he turns to this guy, he's never met him before, he's a middle-aged man, and uh, the, the man looks at this young African and says, so what are you doing? And, the African, and he can tell he doesn't normally have the kind of money to sit in the opera. And he says, what, so what are you doing here? And he says, well, I'm a student, and Miss so-and-so, you know, give me these tickets, and my friend can come, up am here. And, and the guy says, so where are you a student? He says, well, at Continental Theological Seminary. And he says, the guy says, I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> and he says, well, you know, we haven't been accredited. We just got turned down and everything. And, but we're trying to get accredited. The man looks at him and says, I should know about this. And the young man looks and says, well, why would you expect it? He goes, I'm vice president of the parliament. <laughs> I should know about this. And the young man says, well, you know. So he says, you contact me. We're going to look into this. So... A couple of days later, they call this guy, who's the vice president of the parliament of Belgium. And he says, send me your paperwork. So they send him the paperwork. The next meeting of parliament, Continental Theological Seminary was accredited for the first time. Jesus, the Lord. I think about the chain of events. A young man from Africa, riding on a bus, sitting next to, you know, across from this woman, who just happened to be head of higher education. And then that gets turned down, but she kind of gives him tips to the opera. The guy comes in late, doesn't want to, you know, sits down next to him. And it's, the, it's the vice president of the parliament sitting right next to him. Talk about some heavy hitters and talk about what God can do. I say all of that just to say this. That's Saul in your life. God is at work in them in ways you never imagined. We must never give up on these things. Because we are empowered to do something, and that is to see people's lives changed. Take out your piece of paper. We're going to close. I know we're late. Take out your piece of paper. Here's what I'm going to have you do. On that piece of paper, and then you're going to fold it, I'd like you to write the name of that person that comes to your mind who is far from God and might be kind of the Saul that's in your life. That person, you, you think they could never get saved. You know, that person in your mind. Because we're going to pray for them. And we're going to believe together that God is going to do something in their life like he did for Saul. That there's going to be a chain of events. There's going to be a miracle in this process. And we're going to start to see those folks getting saved right here in our church. Okay? So take a moment think about it. Who would it be? Who would be that person that would seem like they are just so far from God? that it would just never happen, just like they thought about Saul. Okay, got that? Write it on the paper and then fold it over. Because what we're going to do is this. We're going to bring these up here to the altar, and we're going to lay them on the, on the steps here. And uh, we're going to put them in an envelope later on, and we'll keep these, and we'll be praying over these as a staff as well. And we're going to just believe together that we're going to see some incredible stories of the Holy Spirit at work seeing people get saved. Who's ready for that?
listen, if he can do what he did in Europe for Continental Theological Seminary, he can do it in our lives too. And I don't think there's probably anybody, any of us know, who was far from God as Saul was. So God can do this. Okay, so if you got that? Okay, so here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to bring them up, lay them on the steps, and as you do, I just want you to say, Lord, go get them. Simple. Lord, go get them. All right? And then you can go back to your chair. Okay, go ahead. Come on up just as you want. And lay them on the steps and say, Lord, go get them. Say, Lord, go get them. Praise the Lord. And then we'll have a prayer in just a moment. Dismiss. Lord, go get them. Father, we thank you for this story of how Saul received Christ, the incredible chain of miracles that led to that conversion. And now, Lord, here before you are a list of names of Saul's in all of our life, people who seem so far from you, God, hardened and angry and distant, in some cases offended and bitter, some, Lord, who just uh, have been badly hurt and damaged. Heavenly Father, we would pray, Holy Spirit, go get them. Lord, we pray that they would you go them. Lord, knock them off a horse if you have to, God. Stop them right in their tracks. Blind them if necessary. Whatever it takes, God, to turn them around. Bring them to you. Heavenly Father, we have a holy discontent of seeing our family, friends, neighbors perishing. Going the wrong direction, Lord. God, we're praying for a change. Lord, we're praying for a change. Lord, we're asking, even in the midst of their disobedience and their anger towards you, God, that you would turn them around. And God, we're asking that these chairs here in our church would be filled with people who are like Saul, but now love you. Lord, we're praying for a baptismal tank that we're wearing out from so many baptisms. God, we're praying this would be a tipping point moment in the lives indicated right here, Lord. Lord, it's going to take a miracle. We know that. And we're calling upon you for that miracle. We know it's not going to be in our smarts or our wisdom or our plans. It'll be in you. So, Heavenly Father, we dedicate them to you, consecrate them to you. And, Lord, again, we say, go get them, Holy Spirit. Bring them home, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. He's a good God, church. Yeah. We're going to see some powerful things. Thank you, Lord.